previously on Cloud Management Monthly. Hello everybody, I'm Eric Lee and I'm your guest on Cloud Management Monthly. I'm here to talk about IT burnout, my experiences, and now what I'm doing with mental health hackers. So to me, just working long hours by itself now and then isn't burnout as long as you have a way to get back afterwards. I realized that I was focusing on work 24-7. I was focusing on the things we didn't get done. I was depressed because we weren't as successful in my group as we were before. There was just a lot of frustration all the way around and I really just didn't know what was going on until my wife was like, hey, look at your hands. And we're sitting there watching TV one day and my hands were just shaking. How you interact with your boss, how much you feel uh, wanted on your team. Um, for me, one of the things is, is accomplishing things at work. That's kind of how I um, label burnout is, uh, for each individual, it's a combination of those factors that put you over that level. And that level is different for each individual person. Hi, my name is Vince Arecchia. I'm a technical marketing manager with VMware and welcome to Cloud Management Monthly with Matt and Dan. Everybody to another episode of Cloud Management Monthly. My name is Dan Kerr. I am here with my co-host Matt Bradford. Matt, how are you doing today? I can't complain, man. It is 41 degrees here in New Hampshire. Um, you know, it's just out walking the dogs and everything. I, I feel bad being stuck indoors right now. I feel like we should be doing this outside. It's it's incredible out there. Yeah, you know, in Buffalo, we uh, when it hits 40 degrees, we start opening up the windows in the house to uh, air out all that winter uh, stink and smell, you know, uh, <laughs> that we've accumulated for the last few months. So we're really looking forward to the, the start of spring here. It has been a cold few weeks. Uh, certainly nothing like what our friends and uh, colleagues are dealing with uh, out in Texas uh, the last couple weeks. But we are we are all looking forward to uh, a springtime break here. So, Matt, I know you're probably asking, where can people find Cloud Management Monthly? Well, the good news is, is that if you want to watch us on YouTube, you can find us at cloudmanagementmonthly.com. Or if you would prefer to listen to the audio version, we got you covered there, too. We are on Spotify and Podbean and Apple and also Google Podcasts. So find us, search us up, and check us out. And if you want to interact with us, you can uh, send us a tweet at CM Monthly. Matt, what do we have coming up today for the show? Yeah, and today's episode is all about configuration management. I mean, we've covered high level topics like what is cloud management? Um, how do you operate your cloud like a public cloud provider and the cloud operating model? And today we're going to just bust right through. We're going to dive right into your configuration files because it's all about configuration management today. How do we how do we make sure that you know we're deploying our applications and our virtual machines in the way that we intend them to you know, run and how do we maintain that? So we're really going to be looking at um, obviously VMware salt stack solution and how we can tie it into things like vRealize automation to make sure that that, you know, component gets deployed with our workloads right at, you know, hour zero, right? So Dan, let's not waste any more time. Let's jump right into the meat and potatoes here. It's Vincent Riccio who's joining us to talk about salt stack and configuration management. Vincent, welcome, man. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, um, so I live in Texas, uh, and <clears throat> we just got out of our winter storm catastrophe. So we're, we're getting, getting normal again. So glad I can make it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I'm a technical marketing manager of VMware, been with the company about eight and a half years and been doing cloud management stuff for the last four or so with VMware. So, uh, always love to talk about it. I could talk about it all day. So glad to be here and, and, and chat with you guys about it for sure. Especially the exciting acquisition of, of salt stack and what we're doing in the config management space, which has been resonating really well with our customers and partners and internally as well. So I don't think we'll have uh, any lack of, of things to talk about. 
that's great because Dan and I do get paid by the minute, so you know we're here all day. For that. Yeah, so I mean, this is this is definitely a very interesting topic for us. I mean, we've normally you know we normally cover a lot of the high level sort of stuff, and um, salt stack and 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 really configuration management seemed like kind of an interesting fit for cloud management. I mean, it almost seems like this is more like you know security driven. So I, I guess maybe the first question is like, how does something like salt stack and, and configuration management tie into cloud management? Yeah, very good question. So I mean, if you look at what VRL animation uh, does right. It's it's your it's your cloud management orchestration tool. But when you look at automation, orchestration, extensibility, you know where is sort of that missing piece uh, of the puzzle? And really, it's it's in guest management of those systems you're deploying. That's a real big. It was a gap, uh, you know. And so we have been a bit reliant on on third party systems, and those, and that's been working great for our customers. We'll continue to support that and do that. But there are some things that we wanted to be able to do. With the with the tool uh, to be able to cover some use cases like software deployment uh, and you know that full end to end automation of not just the VM getting deployed somewhere to a cloud or whatever, right. but to be able to do things inside that guest in an orchestrated way, um, and so it fills that gap. and And we can certainly get into some of the use cases that we plan to to use this for because it, it goes actually a little bit beyond just what Vralize Automation does, and we are looking at using it for all kinds of stuff. So um, it's, you know, it's going to be much broader for our customers than just, hey, deploy to VM and let's let's deploy a package on it. We're planning to use it to do things in the SDDC uh, and all sorts of fun stuff. So that's really kind of the the area with Vralize Automation that we're looking for mainly was to fill that gap uh, and 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 bring that into it. The other two, the other main thing that we're looking at it for, uh, you know, initially, um, another gap that we want to be able to, to close within Vralize Automation a bit more is the software deployment piece of the automation of the VM. Uh, so right now we have some mechanisms to do that, but uh, in the past we've had some things that kind of we've, we've revamped, but now we're looking at SaltStack to be that primary software delivery mechanism uh, as you deploy the virtual machines. Uh, so that was really kind of one of the primary use cases within VRA as well that we wanted to tackle. Oh, that is very interesting. So how would something like that differ from just using a general script to install an application? Yeah, so um, general scripts, right, um, for one thing, uh, aren't as dynamic as what you could do with Salt. So for instance, um, you know, a script, you would have to, uh, uh, you know, essentially just say, okay, I'm gonna have the script somewhere and I pull it down. But with Salt, what we can do is we could say, okay, depending upon certain criteria of the virtual machine or certain, uh, you know, maybe what we call grains that come over from the system and we, it's sort of tag type stuff or, you know, inputs from the user at the time of the deployment, we can do things that orchestrate um, that, you know, that uh, application onto the machine and, and have conditional stuff in there. Like, you know, if the operating system is uh, some Ubuntu version, well, then we need to use these packages and we need to uh, have this kind of configuration set on the machine uh, along with the application. Or uh, we may need to set up certain things a certain way in CentOS or uh, Windows, right, and things like that. So it gives them a lot of flexibility from one place to be able to manage software packages across maybe multiple OSs. Um, and then there's things in there, like I know we don't want to get in the weeds too much, but like Jinja filtering, which allows you to do a lot of conditional things in there. So um, mm -hmm. you could say, if this condition is met, then okay, we want to go ahead and, and install this other package or do some of these other things. The other really cool thing about it is um, we can manage the state of that application post uh, deployment as well. And this is really something I've been actually demoing a lot um, is uh, this reactor beacon technology that can take a look at that application and, man and, and determine if something's changed or if something's not working right or if, you know, the service is consuming a lot of CPU or something, then we can restart it or do something like that within there. So there's, there's, uh, or, you know, a file gets changed and we want to revert it back uh, and stuff like that. So there's this whole orchestration engine that's part of it. Um, and, and also also content that's already there, packages that uh, I could say, look, I just need, you know, uh, Apache installed. Well, Salt's going to know, uh, based on the OS, you know, what package manager to use for that. 
so there's a lot of uh, sophistication that comes along with it and, and uh, ease of use for, for things like that. Plus the UI is really nice for managing those scripts uh, and they can be written in like Python or YAML and things like that. So hopefully that okay. helps a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it almost sounds like kind of policy based deployments in a way, right? Depending upon various conditions and so forth, we know if we're going to use yum or apt or, you know, how we're going to deploy those applications, but also sounds like, you know, we could probably do some dependencies and, and, you know, other kind of interesting things like that, all sort of based on some sort of logic that you define, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, the, the end user or the administrator doesn't even need to specify um, or usually specify those type of things unless they're shelling out uh, to to the machine. So a lot of times it's, hey, I just want to declare that this needs to be on there and then the system determines uh, what package manager to use. But you're right, it is policy driven. Um, and, and in fact, there are some other policy elements to it outside of just uh, deploying a, a software. But, um, you know, it's really kind of this interesting uh, uh, technology of an event bus as well. So what SaltStack brings is uh, this event bus driven orchestration to where based on certain events that occur, uh, whether they're custom events that get created and pushed to the, the Salt Masters or uh, it's just a typical event that might occur in the system, you can base what they call orchestration on that. And that can kick off a series of events um, like installing an app or uh, deploying files to, to a machine or doing certain things. Um, and so, uh, you know, from that perspective, it gives us more than just, hey, I just installed a piece of software, but I'm going to install some software, but then maybe I need to do some other things in the system based upon, you know, maybe some ways that that was installed. So uh, like maybe opening up ports or, uh, you know, reaching out to some other system or uh, notifications or something like that. So yeah, I, th I think we're gonna see it really interesting. Um, and plus once we, you know, roadmap kind of stuff here, but uh, eventually when we get most of that functionality incorporated into the standard VRA uh, cloud template, um, you know, I think we're gonna see a really powerful package manager there that's just kind of natively right out of the box. Yeah. And now the that's, salt piece of it is that's part of an open source project, right? Or it was or is? Yeah, good question. So salt stack as a company had two main product lines. They had their obviously their open source, which we continue to support. And there's teams of people that came over from salt that are still working that and, and supporting that community and, and doing things there. But they also had a commercial product and their commercial product was called salt stack enterprise. Uh, they also had another kind of commercial product with it uh, called SecOps, um, which we are going to uh, allow our customers to continue to buy and incorporate into into the product. And we we we've been demoing it and showing it. Um, but yeah, so they had a commercial product called SaltStack Enterprise, and that was a UI uh, based licensed product that would sit on top of the uh, the engine. And uh, and and it provided not only some additional functionality, but it provided that more of that reactor kind of, you know, system and, and orchestration that was hard to kind of do in a command line. Um, and uh, then also role-based access and, and other things you would expect from the UI, like reporting and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So those were really the two things. The area I focus on is the commercial side, uh, right? So I don't do a whole lot with the open source right now, but uh, so our focus really is how do we get that salt stack uh, what we call salt stack config now, um, more and more incorporated into VRA over time and 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 things like that. And with the release recent release of VR, uh, VRA's automation 8.3, we did some more UI integrations uh, and deployment integrations. So it's it's a lot easier now to get it set up and just access it and start start running with it. Very good. Now, great question. Yeah. So I mean, we we've kind of touched on a lot of different things here. I mean, it's it's sort of deployment. It. And also, we didn't really talk too much about it, but you kind of touched on, you know, checking the status of, of a service or, you know, kind of maintaining that uptime. Sounded like this thing can also kind of keep an eye on that and restart services if it needs to, or tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, I, I didn't know much um, uh, about SaltStack technically before we purchased them. Um, I had been doing a number of things with other configuration management tools for years, but I didn't really know a ton about it. I knew generally some stuff, but one thing that's really kind of impressed me about the product actually is um, 
uh, just how feature rich it is uh, from a from like a technical engineering standpoint. Um, and, and sometimes that can maybe add a little complexity to it. Uh, but there's a lot of really interesting things that they thought about and incorporated into the product. And one of those is uh, there's something called a beacon. And that beacon file can sit on what they call the minion. The minion is the node that gets managed uh, by by the the salt masters. So you know you might have a machine out there you're managing, and you put what they call a beacon file on it. Well, that beacon file can monitor things that happen on that system. And one of those things it can it can monitor is disk usage or like CP usage or uh, memory usage or something like that, or when a director is getting full. And then what you could say, okay, um, beacon, you just noticed that that happened. Um, and now the reactor thing I talked about earlier says, okay, well, what are, what are we going to do about it? And then what you do basically is you create a, what they call a state file that, that does something based on that uh, reporting of the beacon. And, and the reactor beacon technology is, is very interesting, uh, not only for state management and getting things back to normal state if an event occurs, but with that powerful event bus, we can gather information from these minions. And that, that's one thing that kind of has differentiated it, I think, from other technologies. Now, even though that requires an agent, uh, and, and some people may be you know, a little agent averse or something, but that additional functionality from that agent uh, does provide a really nice setup to where you can do things like that, right? You can write what they call a state file that says, um, you know, hey, if, if the beacon reports back that memory usage is 80%, uh, or a service is uh, uh, stopped or something like that, then restart the machine or do something, right? And mm -hmm. and or set off a series of events. So, so yeah, so things like that are interesting. And then and then, um, but but you know, like I said earlier, this been kind of impressed with some of the things that we've been able to do with it that we I didn't expect. I just didn't think we were even going to be able to do with the system. So yeah. I mean, this this is pretty cool. I mean, you're, you're almost like stepping onto be realized operations turf. Hey, back off, buddy. I mean, we're. <laughs> yeah, I thought at... you were going to mention that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not it's not quite there that that uh, sophisticated yet. Yeah. So we're not quite there. We're not doing you know what if planning and uh, yeah uh, that level yeah. of monitoring. But right. um, but you know it it's it's one of those things that you kind of incorporate into maybe your overall workflow and how you want to to look at that system and. Um, but, you know, I don't think that we're going to see people like saying, well, I don't need ops anymore for sure. I think that there's definitely going to be, a, there's definitely not that much overlap for sure. Yeah, complementary system. So you, you mentioned a little bit about the agent that's on there. What type of overhead is required to maintain that consistency? Is it uh, pretty heavy? I'm assuming it's a very lightweight agent, but can you talk about that? It's a, a very lightweight agent. Um, in fact, the way that we install it is just through a bootstrap. Um, so they, they manage a repo. Uh, that makes it pretty easy to pull it down over the internet. And what's nice about doing it that way is it detects the operating system and then puts the right agent on there for you. It, it is lightweight, um, you know, and, and uh, really, I mean, it, there's basically like two ports that need to be open uh, for communication back and forth. Uh, but yeah, there's not a lot of overhead with it. Um, but I will say that the additional functionality that you get with it uh, really does make up for uh, any sort of agent management, what you know, uh, headaches that you might get out of something like that. And and SaltStack also does have an agentless ver uh, uh, architecture too, so you can do agentless if you want to. Uh, right. You could use SSH if you wanted to do that too. You just would lose out on some of the features and scalability and speed uh, that you get with the agent. Yeah, and we're talking about every operating system, right? Is that uh, correct? I mean, it, it can uh, do pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, there is a matrix of the ones that they they support, but like Ubuntu, CentOS, uh, I think even Mac is on there. Obviously, Windows. Um, I have a system back here that runs OS two. Would that OS two? Oh, oh, uh, no, yeah. but you know, um, I'll put that in as an enhancement request and see what they tell <laughs> there you me. Go, great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. hopefully yeah, there's enough memory on it <laughs> right well i'm sure I could, there is I could plenty yeah it's yeah. that thing's maxed out um <laughs> so all right so i'm kind of curious about this agent list thing and i know we said we weren't going to get into the nitty-gritty but it, we just have to i mean you, you, yeah. you stepped on something here now I'm, I'm really curious so how does that work you said ssh like is it just a remote script or, or are we using vm tools or how how on earth does that work 
Yeah, well, I mean, um, if you look at other configuration management solutions, like let's say Ansible, for instance, um, you know, that's agentless. And so SaltStack also has an agentless solution. So essentially what it does is it says, okay, if I'm going to manage a Linux machine, uh, then I'm going to SSH into that machine. And so what you do is you provide the credentials or a key uh, to connect to the machine. So when we run a job against that machine, um, then we're going to use SSH to connect to it and then run that, that job locally um, on, on the machine through, a, through like a, a command that they run. So it's, it's, it's a little bit different, uh, but, um, but it's not an uncommon practice in the configuration management world to do it agentless. Um, and, and predominantly the reason why they do that is because, you know, they want to just kind of say, well, it's easier, but there are some pros and cons to agentless type, you know, connections as well. Um, one is they can be slower. They don't scale as well and you still have to manage security, right? You're talking about opening up SSH on these machines or WinRM and, and then having to lock that down a little bit. That alone can, can add some overhead of management. Right, because like when I do agent lists and other configuration management tools, I have to make sure the users or the keys are there on the image. I have to make sure that, you know, uh, I'm not gonna allow users to be able to SSH in there and do things. So there's pros and cons to both, um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that is an option, um, you know, that, that's there. And I don't know if I'm gonna be promoting it very much, <laughs> uh, but, um, but it certainly would be something that if, if push comes to shove, people could do. Yeah, this sure. seems like, you know, the agent is is really the, you know, the focus for that full featured kind of consistency yeah. and everything. So that that makes sense. Yeah. And I think that's what we want to try to focus on with it, you know, is, um, you know, what are some of the things that it can really help out with and and what we're actually planning to do, too. And, and we should hopefully see this within the next release or two um, is. Uh, uh, being able to from view realize automation when you deploy a virtual machine, there's like a little Boolean value property inside the YAML of that template that says, do you want to install the minion on it? And then on the back end, we do it for them. And uh, we can do that right now through just general cloud init scripts and stuff like that. But, you know, we're going to make it easier to get that minion on there uh, for customers and, and interact with tools and things like that to start doing stuff. So it's, uh, over time, it'll probably be an afterthought um, for customers using Verilize Automation that the minion agent's actually there. It'll just kind of most likely be there, and then they'll be able to do all kinds of fun stuff with it. I don't know how yeah. fun, but it'll be fun. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of fun, I mean, we you know we, we haven't talked a whole lot about SecOps um, from a security standpoint. I mean, that I did see. Part. Really cool demo from uh, you know Chris on our tech marketing team who um, you know showed us a, a website that that got hacked and and we were able to you know change it back within seconds um, you know to kind of prevent any sort of further spread and so forth. Like I thought that was just the coolest thing. It was, it was probably one of the first things I saw with Salt Stack and um, you know so maybe like you know tell us a little bit more about SecOps and and you know that kind of thing. Yeah, well that that demo you actually saw and and, and he and I have been doing that demo I think feels like in our dreams now we've done it so much, but, but that particular demo, um, uh, or in our sleep now, um, that particular demo basically is, isn't even a SecOps feature, uh, which is kind of cool. And, and that demo actually is, um, just the reactor beacon technology that comes right out of the box with, with solid stack and fig. So you don't actually, I'll get into SecOps here in a sec, but you don't actually need SecOps to do that. So there is some like remediation kind of compliancy stuff you can do just with the reactor beacon. Uh, the, 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 the challenge there to some extent is you have to set it up and SecOps is a little different. Um, so I'll get into that, but yeah, the demo you're talking about where we deploy the app, uh, the website and then we hack it. Um, and then it goes back to its original state is actually right. just a traditional reactor beacon set up uh, within the, uh, the software. SecOps, though, is really interesting. And, and as I've talked to customers who were like already talking to Salt Stack before we even acquired them, uh, a number of them were actually already looking at SecOps from Salt Stack as something they were very interested in. So they were very happy to hear that we aren't like abandoning that or anything, um, that we are still selling that. Um, but there's there's really kind of two things under that SecOps umbrella, and there's 
uh, something called comply, which is like compliance inside your system, inside your environment. And then it was something called protect, which is more vulnerability management. So there's really two key aspects to it. One is um, looking for uh, compliancy type stuff in the environment. There's a bunch of CIS benchmarks that get downloaded, or you can upload them if you're in, a, in an air gapped environment. And they have all these sort of benchmarks in there with these checks in there. So you might have a Ubuntu uh, benchmark, a Windows benchmark, um, all these different CIS benchmarks that will look for, you know, maybe 10 to 100 different things per benchmark, depending upon which, which one you're looking at. And it actually uses its own technology to make the change. So it actually uses state files and things already that are built into Salt Stack to look at that. So you can target certain minion systems or just do all your minions and go and look for these benchmarks and see which ones are in compliant. Then you get a nice report out of it, um, and then you can remediate. Uh, and so those are the type of things that you can do with that. So there's a remediation from more of a CIS kind of uh, compliance type perspective uh, that can be done with that particular technology. And the other one is the vulnerability management or the protect, uh, which looks for, you know, like, a, 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 you know, regulatory compliance type stuff. And then you can remediate and, and have policy driven stuff around that as well. So those two things are very exciting for, for our customers. They really like it. Um, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's actually been a little more of a hot topic than I would have imagined. But so, yeah, it's definitely something to check out if you're, if you're looking for that kind of thing. And, and what's nice about it is you can do it all from the same interface. So, install stack config UI, you have your comply protect there, you have your reactor beacon there. Uh, so just the options are, you know, pretty unlimited in terms of what you can do for remediation and, and uh, sort of getting things, you know, managing your state of your environment. Yeah, and that focus on automation for SecOps too, I think is really key, right? It's, you know, recognizing something that's uh, drifted or changed and then immediately taking an automated action to remediate it. So that uh, seems like it fits right within the wheelhouse of what SaltStack uh, is doing for SecOps. So that's great to hear. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and that's also fills the gap for V-Realize Automation, right? I mean, we haven't really had a way to look at and do a whole lot with something after the fact. So we deploy it and then we we look for changes or we, we can detect if somebody added a CPU or made a change, but we don't really have a good way, we haven't had a good way inside the system to do something about it um, because a lot of the trigger events for like our subscriptions are based on things that, that happen inside of VRA, not outside of VRA. So unless they build that stuff themselves, um, and it, 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 that, that functionality wasn't really there. So SaltStack has actually filled a gap for us in that aspect as well. You know, you deploy something and then we continue to, 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 to look at it for state management, things like that. So I, I, think, I think customers are ultimately going to find that to be pretty helpful. Right, mm. right. And so, you know, so how is SaltStack consumed, right? It, we know it's uh, now part of the VRI's automation, um, uh, ver, you know, edition, but is there a standalone? Is it have to be consumed with VRI's automation? Yeah, good question. So, um, you know, there's always a few options there um, uh, with most of our products, right? So right. Um, one is just the normal kind of way is if you're a VRI suite, vCloud suite, or VRealize Automation 8 customer, if you have those licenses in your portal, then you are entitled to Salt Stack Config. You are entitled to it. So you can download that OVA, install it through uh, Lifecycle Manager, and then it will show up inside of your VRealize Automation UI as a service uh, that you can click on and, and start to access. So that is the primary uh, or, or first way, and, and probably the most common way people are going to to consume it is they'll just have it with their suites and and all that kind of stuff. Um, we are, we are releasing it in a, in the in America. We have already released this. It'll go global, hopefully within the next few weeks. Um, is the one I was trying to pronounce earlier, the Vrealize Automation uh, Standard uh, Salt Stack Standard Plus, or I'm sorry, Vrealize Automation Standard Plus. I knew I was going to say that wrong. So Vrealize Automation <laughs> Standard Plus uh, will get released globally. That will be standalone salt stack. Got it. Config. Okay. That will be the standalone version of the product. 
Um, and, uh, and, and so eventually that will be more incorporated into LCM and things like that. But today, if someone were to buy it, they would download it and they would install uh, SaltStack standalone onto a CentOS machine. Um, so that's how that uh, work, works today. And so the, the interesting thing there, at least in the near term, will be that there will not only be, you know, packaging or maybe licensing or uh, cost decisions there, but it could also be an architectural discussion because uh, if you wanted to, let's say, do multi-master in a large scale environment, uh, managing millions of nodes or maybe hundreds of thousands of uh, different devices and nodes out there, uh, then the standalone might actually be uh, the way to go currently uh, because uh, uh, of the way we can scale it. Uh, now, it doesn't mean you don't need the realize suite, but you could get it as an add-on, right? And that could be an option. Um, and, and eventually we'll have that kind of capability within uh, the, the traditional salt stack config that we see in VRA, right? So there could be some other things that we're working through there to see what differences are. But those are really the two primary methodologies that I can think of right now that you would get it. The other thing on the SecOps piece, just to let you know, is that is a standalone SKU as well. So there's no entitlement to that. That would just be a, a separate a la carte purchase. Got it. Got it. Very good. Mm -hmm. So we've covered a lot of ground here with, you know, one application. I mean, it sounds like it slices, it dices, it stirs, it fries, it'll even season your food. Is there anything right else? Right now it feels that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Is there anything else that, that you know, we, we maybe haven't touched on yet that, that you'd like to add? Yeah, I think one thing that I did want to also mention um, in this podcast, it, because, you know, the, the title was Configuration Management at, as well, right? Not just alt stack. And I think I did want to also just bring up and make sure that our customers understand or that users of your automation understand that we are not abandoning uh, our other configuration management plugins, right? We still do support Ansible open source, Ansible Tower and Puppet enterprise plugins in the product. There's still roadmap for those plugins. Uh, we are even looking at expanding that out into some other tools potentially. Uh, so, you know, um, the question I get often is, you know, am I, if I'm using VRA, am I going to be forced into using salt stack for config management? And the answer is no, right? It's just going to be another option. What you'll probably see is that technologies and features of salt stack will be more interwoven into the product as part of just your, your daily use of it. But it's, it's not going to negate the Ansible plugin or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to kind of preface that too, just so, you know, it doesn't sound like, you know, hey, my Ansible plugin is not going to be available in the next release or something like that, because that's not gonna, not the case. Got it. Yeah, Great. that's definitely important. So cool. Well, Vincent, thanks so much for, you know, geeking out with us for a little bit. I mean, we, we definitely went yeah, a lot fun. deeper than anticipated but this is this is some pretty exciting stuff so really appreciate yeah, I think your time it is. yeah and 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 you know we've had a lot of fun talking about it learning it and i know you know sometimes i i talk about it, it does sound like it it's the best thing since sliced bread but right now we're just super excited about it over here in the bu so um you know so forgive us for that but uh, hopefully hopefully our customers will enjoy it as much as we have yeah is there any place vincent that uh if somebody wants to get a hold of you or communicate with you anything uh, any way that they can get in touch with you um, yeah, so a couple ways out there that might be um, might be good is if you go out to blogs, uh, wmr.com forward slash management, I have a number of blogs out there that I've written about SaltStack. You can always comment on there. I do try to pay attention to those as much as possible. Um, on Twitter, uh, I do have a handle at uh, Vincent underscore Riccio, uh, which is my name underscore and then my last name. Uh, so, um, you know, feel free to, 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 to hit me up on that as well. Excellent. We'll make sure we put uh, all that information in the description also uh, on the podcast. So, man, uh, really, really great information. Thank you so much for taking some time today to uh, come on the show, talk with Matt and I, and let us know about all the goodness that Salt Stack's bringing. Cool. No problem. So, Dan, that's yet another episode uh, in the books here. That was such a cool conversation for us. I mean, I 
you know, I work alongside Vincent and uh, lots of stuff about SaltStack that I certainly didn't know. I mean, you know, using something like this for even just kind of the deployment um, and for, you know, kind of doing some of that that's almost policy driven type of, you know, deployment and compliance and all these things really kind of all of a sudden everything just sort of clicked together. It's like, oh, OK, now I see why this is part of, you know, VMware's cloud management business unit, how this fits into the cloud management story. So yeah, really cool. And- how about you? It is, yeah. I really think what's interesting is all that event-driven configuration management that can happen, right? It has the reactors, the beacons. You know, when it sees a drift or sees something, it can immediately take action to uh, to remediate and bring things back within compliance. And, you know, also that whole SecOps uh, piece of it too, right? It's not just uh, configuration management. It's also that uh, security operations uh, part of it. Yeah, what a cool thing. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for geeking out with us. This is probably our geekiest episode yet. I mean, you know, with the exception of maybe that Christmas episode, but I think that was something (laughs) entirely different, man. Um, So with that, I mean, where can people go and get more uh, Cloud Management Monthly content? Yeah, you got it, Matt. So if you want to uh, check out the video podcast uh, episodes, you can go to cloudmanagementmonthly.com. That'll take you right to YouTube. If you would rather prefer to listen to the audio version, we are available on Apple and Spotify and Google and Podbean. And, uh, you know, feel free to uh, send us a tweet at CM Monthly on Twitter. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody, for watching yet another episode of Cloud Management Monthly. We'll catch you next month. See you, everybody. (laughs) I think I just got our new tagline, Matt, for the show. We're your practice podcast. (laughs) Yeah. Dan can be Cindy Lou Who. Yeah, that's fine. Hey, whatever gets his views. I don't care. It's not the the first time I dressed as a girl. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) That's... That's going to be cut. I hope we're recording. Yeah, we are recording. Oh, Oh, we're recording. Okay, good. (laughs) Should have told you that. Probably should have told you that. Professional podcast would would probably have told you that at the beginning. You're like, come on, do your thing. This is what, eight months we've been doing this? (laughs) Just figuring it out. (laughs) Bing. (laughs) Why don't you just, well, (laughs) just come in from the side like that. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.